So yeah, Nagarjuna, um, he's kind of amazing. He's kind of um, not easy. Uh, there's um, there's a lot of uh, abstraction. There's a lot of uh, he's immersed in philosophical um, debates of his time, which we have no idea what they were. You know, I was thinking it's sort of like. Uh, if you think of music of the 13th century, if you lived in the 13th century, you'd say, oh, that's Italian style. Oh, that's French style. Oh, that's Spanish style. But we listen to it and all we hear is 13th century. We can't tell. So we don't know, you know, what the, I mean, scholars do, but most of us don't. So yeah, he's not an easy read. And yet at the same time, for some people, like I'm one of them, he just grabs you. You know, I remember the first time I read him, I, it just grabbed me. And I should tell you what I read. It's this book. It's um, Jay Garfield's really brilliant translation and commentary on the Mula Majimaka Karika, which means fundamental wisdom of the middle way. Um, Majika means the middle way. And um, uh, Garfield is a very serious a uh, student of Tibetan Buddhism, and he actually translated from Tibetan and not from um, the Sanskrit that the book was originally written in. And he's also a very major scholar of Buddhist philosophy. Um, so he brings these two strengths of, um, you know, real immersion in Buddhist practice and at the same time, the intellectual knowledge of Buddhist uh, philosophy. He can tell you what the different schools are, and he does in the book that uh, Nagarjuna is um, engaging in. So I should start out by saying, who is Nagarjuna? So we don't really know. The way um, time was recorded in uh, South Asia at the time Nagarjuna was living is very ambiguous. So we don't even, don't even know if he lived in the first century or the second century. Um, common era. We, we really know very little about him. We do know that he hung around with uh, kings and other leaders, that he was very highly regarded, um, that we, you know, he wrote like practical things for, you know, how to rule and how to live and stuff like that. But he also wrote this, this and other really amazing philosophical texts, which formed the basis of the Majjhimaka, the middle way of, um, of Mahayana Buddhism. And he also supposedly is the person who went down under the sea to the Naga kingdom. You know, the Nagas were these sort of mer people, except they were human at the top and then snakes on the bottom. They weren't fish, they were snakes. Um, and they lived in the bottom of the ocean. They were the guardians of the Prajna Paramita Sutras. And supposedly Nagarjuna went down there and they gave him, they said, oh, you are awakened enough that we can give you these sutras and you can bring them up and you can teach them to people. So, um, and the Garjana means Naga person. That's the translation of the name Nagarjuna. So who is Nagarjuna? We really know very little. That's about what we know. And some of it obviously is myth. Um, I gave you two chapters of the book to read and I'll get to one of them in detail later. I want to read you the other chapter names. They all start examination of, and then the first is conditions, that is conditions for things to arise, motion, senses, aggregates, and someone asked about it, that's the skandhas, the aggregates, um, form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, which doesn't mean impulsive feelings, but the impulse to act, and consciousness. That's what the world is made of. Um, elements, desire and the desirous, conditioned, agent and action, prior entity, fire and fuel, initial and final limits, suffering, compounded phenomena, connection, which means among scenes, like the scene, the seeing, the act of seeing, and the seer, or desire, the desirous one, the one who desires, and the object of desire. So that's what connection is about. Essence, bondage, which means bondage to samsara, actions and their fruits, which is karma, self and entities, 
time, combination, which means of causes, among causes and effects, becoming and destruction, tathagata, which means the Buddha, errors, which means defilements and cognitive errors, the Four Noble Truths, Nirvana, the Twelve Links and the Chain of Codependent Origination, and Views. So that's so I gave you the chapter on um, uh, fire and fuel because it's m the most accessible because it's about we actually have a physical thing it's talking about and then the last chapter on views. So forging ahead. One reason I really like Garfield's translation is because he does not look at Nagarjuna solely as a philosopher. He also looks at him as a practitioner and a teacher of practitioners. But I want to talk about Nagarjuna's philosophy first. The basic concern of the Mula Madhyamaka Karika is what exists, in what sense does it exist, where does it or where do they come from, i.e., what is real and how did it get here? So it's really focused on what philosophers call ontology, what is. And the context in which he's writing, besides these raging philosophical arguments among contemporary schools, um, are the three marks of existence, suffering, impermanence, and no self. The Abhidharma, which is the Buddhist um, analysis of perceptual psychology and cognitive psychology. What's called the true truths, uh, absolute versus relative, or in Garfield's translation, it's often absolute versus um, conventional, he uses the word conventional often instead of relative, and that translates into nirvana versus samsara. And then the raging philosophical arguments among schools basically breaks into two classifications. You have reification, which means making things real. So for example, you have a word goodness, and that means there has to be a thing called goodness. You have a word loud, and that means there has to be a thing called loudness. So that's reification. And then the opposite of that is nihilism. And nihilism means no, 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 whatever you say, no, 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 no. And that's obviously, you know, grossly simplistic. Um, there's all kinds of other things that enter into it, but if we think of it, the reifiers versus the nihilists, that kind of gives us a good context for Nagarjuna. So the Majumaka, which literally means middle way, means the middle way between reification, it is, and nihilism, it is not. So it's not, the middle way is not lukewarm between hot and cold, and it's not between loud and soft, and it's not between tall and short. The middle way is between it is and it is not. So that's a very important thing to know. And the two key concept, concepts are emptiness and codependent origination or dependent co-origination, or as Thich Nhat Hanh brilliantly calls it, interbeing. So we've got this context, this Buddhist philosophical context. We've got these two key concepts. And then we have this basic thesis, way, way, way oversimplified, way oversimplified. So everything is inherently empty. And that means that impermanence and no self nature, the two of the three marks of existence, are natural consequences of emptiness. So emptiness is sort of the thing lying underneath impermanence and no self nature. They're natural consequences of emptiness. And so is codependent origination. But emptiness is not a thing. It's not a substance. 
it itself is empty. In fact, it's so empty that I said in my previousness that I sent to you, you almost can't even say that it's empty. The universe is like a play of shadows. And now you might think of Plato's cave, which some of you know about. So Plato's cave, the image is people live in this cave. And what they see in front of them is they see the wall of this cave. That's all they see is the wall of this cave. And they think that's reality. And nobody ever turns around and sees the light. Everybody just sees the wall of this cave. But to Plato, the light was where reality was. That's where the real things were. And what we saw was the shadows. So that's like the relative is unreal and the absolute is real. But to Nagarjuna, the world is like a play of shadows, but the shadows are what's there. Absolute equals relative. Absolute equals conventional. And like I said, it's way, way oversimplified to say it this way. But what does this have to do with Buddhist, here's a word for you, soteriology. So soteriology means the doctrine of salvation. And in Buddhism, what, why do we practice? We practice to wake up, to wake up and help this world, but to, you know, wake up get enlightenment, right? Scare quotes. So what does this have to do with waking up? What does this have to do with getting enlightenment? So the third link, I'm sorry, the third um, mark of existence is suffering. And suffering comes exactly from incorrect understanding. Suffering comes from thinking that the absolute and the relative are distinct. Suffering comes from thinking that things actually have substance. Suffering comes from not perceiving correctly. So what seems like abstract philosophy actually becomes urgent. And when I first read uh, Nagarjuna, it was his urgency that really struck me. You know, I read him sort of as a poet and as well as a practitioner and the urgency of these four line stanzas, the urgency of the quatrains and the way they kept hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering away, slight, slight, slight variations on the same theme really grabbed me, it just really struck me. So what is nirvana then? Nirvana is not a state separate from samsara. Samsara is the world of suffering. Nirvana is the world of enlightenment. Nirvana is correctly perceiving samsara. If we look at this world around us and we correctly perceive it, that in itself is nirvana. And so somewhere in here, Nagarjuna says, Nirvana is samsara, samsara is nirvana. But, wait, there's less. Because the last verse of the Madhyamaka Karika says, I prostrate to Gautama, who through compassion taught the true doctrine, which leads to the relinquishing of all views. And the question is, what does Nagarjuna mean by that? And some people say, all views except for this one, I'm right. But Garfield says, and in my gut, I have no scholarly evidence, just in my gut, I agree with him, and I think any Zen practitioner would agree, it means relinquishing all views, including this view. Whatever view you just said, relinquish it. So that's a sort of, potted, quick um, uh, version of Nagarjuna's philosophy. Um, I want to say a little bit uh, uh, personally of what I get out of it. One of the things I get out of it is, you know, we have this noun-verb distinction. Things do things. You know, this, you know, entity over here does this thing. 
maybe the entity there or maybe just simply does something like swims, you know. But the whole distinction between noun and verb just kind of explodes when you think about this. When you read Nagarjuna, it has these, these uh, chapters like um, agent and action, fire and fuel, you know, does the fuel cause the fire? Are they the same? Are they different? And the nouns and verbs just explode. And I have to tell you a confession. When I was 15 years old, I was very weird. And I had a diary entry which wrote, which read exactly as follows. And I wrote it in really big letters. The structure of language. And when that is destroyed, so I was really weird, right? But that's what Nagarjan is doing. He's very meticulously using logic and language. He's exploding logic and he's exploding language. Um, another thing I want to say um, when we're thinking of when we use this word conventional about reality, and there's this image that I've been using a lot recently, and maybe one of these days I'll switch to another image. But if you're a fish swimming in the water and there's a stick floating in the water, so you're swimming here and there's a stick floating there, and you look up at it, you do not see a stick. You don't have the concept of stick. You're a fish, what do you know of sticks? Right? So this notion of conventional doesn't mean, you know, you wear the right clothes so everyone approves of you. It doesn't mean that, you know, you keep your lawn mode doesn't mean that, you know, you take your garbage out on garbage day and don't throw it around on the street. Conventional means that you make these concepts which everyone around you agrees. Yep, this is a stick. This is a pen. Everyone agrees this is a pen, right? But put the pen in the water. Fish doesn't know it's a pen. What does a fish know about pens, right? So that's what conventional means in this. So then we can ask, okay, that's the you know, very condensed, oversimplified version of his philosophy. Does it actually work? And there's a wonderful article that I came across by a guy named Richard Robinson, who's a great Nagarjuna scholar. And unfortunately, it's protected by, um, uh, what do you call the scholarly thing? It's behind a paywall. But um, it's called, did, did Nagarjuna really refute all philosophical views? Because that's what he claims to be doing. He's refuting all philosophical views. And Robinson, um, this is a very hard to read article, by the way. So unless you're serious about philosophy, I wouldn't recommend reading it. But if you are comfortable with technical philosophy, send me a note and I'll send you a, a copy. Um, but what he does in this article is he lists axioms that Nagarjuna does, doesn't explicitly state. Like one of them is whatever has extension, extension means existence, physical existence is divisible hence is composite, hence is not permanent and not real. Well, you could argue with that, right? And then another thing was a real thing would have to be an utterly simple individual which contains no diversity. Think of like a billiard ball that's really 100% billiard ball. It's not made up of atoms or anything, right? It's just if it had diversity, it would have extension and therefore would not be indivisible and real. Well, you can go through these. He lists six of them. And um, you can say, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that's true. So no, Nagarjuna did not refute all philosophical views. Nobody does, you know, because somebody can say, oh, I just don't agree with that. And then, you know, they're not refuted. There you go. Um, but what Nagarjuna does do and this is where the soteriology comes in. He's pointing to practice. He's pointing to doubt, great doubt. He's pointing to great question. He's giving us a methodology. And that more than any of his conclusions, because conclusions live here. The methodology lives here. And what Nagarjuna is giving us is a methodology to look at our ideas and our opinions and our assumptions. And some of this sort of 
some of Nagarjuna's concerns kind of leaks into the koans. Um, some of his particulars, like the uh, four propositions and the 100 negations, are explicitly mentioned in koans. But I want to mention um, four koans where the um, this question of how do things arise comes up. And the most famous is in the Mumun Kwan, and this is from uh, the, um, it's case 29, but it really comes from the um, Platform Sutra, the Sutra of the Sixth Ancestor. You know, two monks are arguing about a wind and a flag, and one says the flag is moving, and the other says wind is moving, and um, the Sixth Patriarch Queen Ung shows up and says, it is your minds that are moving. And he says, oh, you must be the Sixth Ancestor. Oh, we've heard about you, you know? So you might wonder, why are two monks standing outside arguing about whether the wind or the flag is moving? This sounds like kindergartners, you know? But that's basically the kind of thing that appears in the Mula Majjama Makakarika, you know? What is the origin of the movement? What is the relationship between the wind and the flag? So that's one place. Another place, a little more subtle, is Ge Chung made carts, and that's the eighth case in the Mumun Khan. And I'll read that to you. So Master Wolam said to a monk, Ge Chung made a cart, the wheels of which had a hundred spokes. Take both front and rear parts away and remove the axle. What then becomes clear? So that is embedded in the question of what does it mean to exist? What is the essence of a cart? You know, you take, find it again, you take the, um, get, get the order right here, uh, you take the front part away, is it still a cart? You take the rear part away, is it still a cart? You remove the axle, is it still a cart? I remember when I was first starting to practice and I'd sit there and I'd think, what happens if my hand fell off, would I still be me? Maybe both hands, would I still be me? Maybe my feet, would I still be me? <laughs> I go through all these parts of the body. My brain, what if my brain was missing? Would I still be me? You know? So that's that's sort of the 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 um, context for that. Um, and then the Blue Cliff Record, case twenty one. Look that up too. A monk asked Ji Mun, when the lotus flower has not yet emerged from the water, how is it? Is it a lotus flower? And Ji Mun said, lotus flower. And then the monk said, after it has emerged from the water, how is it? And Ji Mun said, lotus leaves. At what point do you get to say, that is the lotus flower. When it's a seed? When it starts sending off little tendrils? At what point do you say, oh, this is a lotus flower? And then in the whole world is a single flower, the 14th case, and I tried to find this, like the original source for this. It's not in the Mumun Kwan, it's not in the Blue Cliff Record. I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it's in the uh, Book of Equanimity. I didn't check there. Um, but, you know, one day as the big temple bell is being rung, the Buddha said to Ananda, where does the bell sound comes from? So this is one of the ones where, you know, Ananda looks kind of silly. Where does the bell count sound come from? Ananda says, the bell. And the Buddha says, oh, the bell. But if there were no bell stick, how would the sound appear? And Ananda said, oh, yeah, the stick, the stick. And then Buddha says, the stick. If there were no air, how could the sound come from there? And Ananda said, oh, right, right, it comes from the air. And Buddha said, air? But if you don't have an ear, you can't hear it. And Ananda said, oh, yeah, I need an ear. Yeah, so it comes from the ear. And the Buddha said, ear? If you have no consciousness, how do you understand it? And Ananda said, oh, my consciousness makes the sound. And then the Buddha says, your consciousness? Ananda, if you have no mind, how do you hear the bell sound? And Ananda says, oh, it was created by the mind alone. So this is a reference to um, Huayan Buddhism. But this 
dialogue. Where does the bell sound come from? That's the same context, the same, the same kind of question that Nagarjuna is looking at. And in all of these kongans, because they're kongans, our job is to do better. So the sixth patriarch says, it's your mind that's moving and we can do better than that. And um, we can do better than, you know, before the lotus flowers emerged, it's a lotus flower. After it's emerged, leaves. We can do better than that. Where does the bell sound come from? Mind alone. We can do better than that. Don't hold any views. This is very important. So it's not about conclusions. It's about method. It's about questioning everything. And somebody uh, in the class wrote, and if they want to identify themselves, they're welcome to, because this was a great note they wrote. Um, they read the, um, the uh, handout and wrote, to, oh no, I said something in, in, in a Dharma talk. And they, they wrote and they said, you talked about Nagarjuna's middle way as the sky not being blue and the sky not, not being blue. Or in another talk, you taught about not exist and not not exist. So my question is, is this then straight experience? So if I experience the sky, it isn't blue and it isn't not blue. Is it what my eyes see, my eyes hear, etc.? Then do we follow the middle way by experiencing directly and not attaching to the words, ideas, thoughts, etc.? Or is it something else? That's just a terrific question. And then I responded, these are excellent questions and they don't have easy answers because the terms in which they or any other questions are couched are themselves questionable. For example, what is straight experience? What is it? You know, that's a giant question. And if you give me an answer, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Whatever answer you give, I'm going to say no. What is direct experience? Um, yeah, you know, when you think of how experience is, is mediated by the sense organs and by the nervous system and by the brain and whatever consciousness is and whatever mind is, you know, what is straight experience? What does that possibly mean? Um, the closer you look at it, the more it dissolves. And that's the point. Nagarjuna's Manjamaka is not a set of conclusions, but a methodology. Question everything. Not questioning on the level of, is the sky blue? but questioning as manifesting the awareness that experiencing a blue sky is a complex combination of sensory input, the mediation within the brain and nervous system by which we are conscious of it, and the language by which we learn to describe, express our consciousness down to the arbitrariness of noun-verb distinction. Look at every piece of that, not in the scientific sense of studying the brain, etc., but in the Watteau sense of what is this, what is this? And that is how I would summarize Nagarjuna's method, not the way he would summarize it, because he would never say mediation within the brain and the nervous system. That wasn't in his vocabulary. That was like the fish looking at the stick, right? But more important, because summarizing is not his methodology. He doesn't summarize. He does it, patiently picking apart all our conventional tropes. And at this point, I want to... Begin, I'm not going to do the whole thing, begin by looking very carefully at chapter 10, the examination of fire and fuel. So Nagarjuna begins this by saying, if fuel were fire, then agent in action would be one. If fire were different from fuel, then it couldn't rise without fuel. It would be forever a flame. Flames could be ignited without a cause. Its beginning would be meaningless. In that case, it would be without action. And we say, well, you know, fire doesn't arise without some kind of fuel, right? So we can immediately see that saying that fire is different from fuel is problematic. Going on, he's still talking about fire being different from fuel. Since fire would not depend on another, ignition would be without a cause. If it were eternally in flames, starting it would be meaningless. So if one thinks that that which is burning is the fuel, if it is just this, how is this fuel being burned? So now he's, first he looks at the fire, now he looks at the fuel. 
If they are different, and if one not yet connected isn't connected, remember there's a whole thing about connection, the not yet burned will not be burned. They will not cease. If they do not cease, then will persist with its own characteristic. You know, like, hey, whatever you said doesn't make sense. That's what, that's his methodology. And then the interlocutor, usually called the opponent, there's, he actually has several opponents, but the interlocutor from another school of Buddhist philosophy says, just as a man and a woman connect to one another as man and woman, so if fire were different from fuel, fire and fuel would have to be fit for connection. And if fire and fuel preclude each other, then fire being different from fuel, it still must be assertive that they connect. If fire depends on fuel and fuel depends on fire, and what are fire and fuel established as dependent? Which one is established first? And then Nagarjuna starts knocking down that. If fire depends on fuel, it would be the establishment of an established fire. And the fuel could not be fuel without any fire. If that on which an entity depends is established on the basis of the entity depending on it, I made one line into two, uh, two lines into one by mistake, what is established in dependence on what? So he just keeps knocking down, knocking down, knocking down, knocking down, whatever you want to say, no. You want to say that? Nope. Here's why it's ridiculous. Here's why it's ridiculous. Here's why it's ridiculous. You know? And like I said, this logical thing is based on these hidden axioms, which he never states. And he might not have ever sat down and stated them to himself the way, um, um, the way Richard Robinson does. But they're sort of there. You know, they're hidden in the background. And you can argue with them. So it's not like... Nagarjuna is necessarily negating all views, but he's giving us a method. He's giving us a method. Whatever somebody is saying, whatever you are saying, whatever you are thinking, look at that. Look at that and say, does this really make sense? Is this how things really are? What assumptions am, am I making in order to make this statement? And look deeply at those and look deeply at those and dissolve and dissolve and dissolve and dissolve everything. And that's basically the methodology that we get from Nagarjuna. And it is basically the methodology of Zen practice. So Nagarjuna is, he's foundational to Zen and to Tibetan Buddhism, which are just about as different as you can imagine. It's like the Catholic Church and the Quakers, you know, but he stands at the base of both of them. And it's this questioning, questioning, questioning attitude and this deep analysis of emptiness until even that dissolves. That's what Nagarjuna really gives to Zen practice. And I'm very glad to see that Jane added herself as the writer of that wonderful email. Um, thank you very much. So that was a lot of talk. And now People can unmute themselves and ask questions. And since I'm spotlighted, you will not appear. Only your voice will appear. So are there any questions? Just unmute yourself if you have a question. I have a question. Qu <laughs> okay, Jane. <laughs> in, in like practical, in a practical life, mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about, well, if I, you know, when does, when is it a lotus? Is it the seed? Is it a, mm -hmm. is it when it's a stem? Is it when it's flowered? Mm -hmm. And the first thing I thought of was the, the worldly question of when does a life begin? Is it, is it a, and so when you're decom decomposing this or questioning or asking this and there's no answer, mm -hmm. How do you deal with this in a practical life sense, like we're trying to do right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. And this is where, you know, I've been 
emphasizing the abstract um, con uh, the abstract uh, part of his philosophy, and he certainly writes abstractly. But this business about nirvana is samsara, and the absolute is the conventional. So we're not going to have agreement on a question like, when does a human life begin? We don't even know what life is, like a virus is alive, you know? Um, so to be open to the realization that we are not going to have definitive answers to these things, but also to be open to the realization of human suffering. And what aspects of human suffering are we most open to? What really, you know, hits us in our heart? When you read, um, you know, one of the, the things about the so-called pro-life, the anti-abortion position, is that it covers over a lot of really wrenching situations that people are faced in, faced with when considering whether or not to have an abortion, you know, women's lives being in danger, um, fetuses having, you know, being born into a very short life of terrible pain. There are many, many things that, um, that can happen that we usually don't think of. So what aspect of the situation are you thinking of? And we're all going to come to our own conclusions of it, about this. And what is being encouraged here is flexibility. Not being an absolutist about anything. So if you're not an absolutist, then you won't write laws that are absolute. You won't write laws that are banning this or banning that. You know, you'll write laws that are humane. That take into account the circumstances. So you're not going to be able to answer when does a human life begin. We don't even really know what life is. And you're not going to be able to say, oh, according to Nagarjuna's philosophy, this is what we should do about abortion. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, but you can bring humility to your own thinking about it. And that includes bringing humility to your own thinking about people who disagree with you. I mean, if there's one thing about the political situation now that really breaks my heart, it's the way people can't even talk to each other. Because you disagree with me, therefore you're completely not even quite human, is sort of the way a lot of people think right now. And to bring some kind of humility to everything, that's really what, what, you know, if you're going to look for political morality, that's what you're going to get from the middle way, is this humility. So thank you for your question. Are there any other questions? Hey, uh, Judy. So yeah. do you get the sense that his... Uh, I mean, when I read the fire and fuel thing, I was all of a sudden transported back into the 10th grade, you know, like doing geometry groups. And uh, I, I did recover from that feeling. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, and so I, I spent a, a fair amount of time, like going through different parts of the tech, trying to discover, you know, what are his givens? What are his givens? Because that's where you have to start. And I ultimately concluded that his, you know, his givens and his conclusions are the same. And, uh, you know, I was just wondering if uh, you saw it that way. Well, first of all, you, um, and I'd like to ask people not to ask questions in the chat, okay? Um, wait and, and, and unmute yourself and ask, because I know some people are doing that. Um, so, um, yeah, so in, you were really hampered because I gave you two chapters out of 
what, 26, 27 chapters, right? I can never remember how many. Um, it's 27, I think. Seven, yeah, that's what I think, too. Okay, and I didn't give you the first chapter. I gave you the 10th chapter and the last chapter. And so how did you know what the assumptions were? He's building, you know, that 10th chapter is built, you know, the first chapter, and then the second builds on the first, and the third builds on the second, and so on and so forth. So you were kind of hampered in in what you were trying to do. And as I said, he never really states clearly what his axioms are. Um, I, did, I did find that, so I found chapter 10, you know, unsatisfying, and, and I had the book. So I, I think it's chapter 24, uh -huh. where he goes through the, the four noble truths. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that, you know, that really made more sense to me because then you could see, uh, you, you know, how he, then he kind of reveals his thinking about Buddhism, it, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. He, he covers up the Buddhism until towards the end. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. So that's admitting uh, an important context and he's just covering it up. He doesn't talk about it until the really last quarter or so of the book. Right. And my other question is, doesn't this really kind of, you know, there's a huge, uh, you know, body of literature around, the, you know, the Vinaya and, mm -hmm. you know, ethical precepts and so forth. And doesn't that really just sort of level this, <laughs> down into a lot of rubble. What do you mean by that? You mean we shouldn't worry about what exists because we're told how to behave? I mean, there is no, well, I mean, it's, you know, I guess every, I don't know, every form embodies its opposite, right? So, uh, you, you know, there, I mean, any, I don't know, any, practice form, any monastic form is just as good as any other monastic form. I don't understand what that has to do with, with this, with the Mula Majjhima Karika. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, he's not exempting anything from his analysis. Right. So, precepts, you know, Buddhism itself, any aspect of Buddhism itself is, you know, captured in his logic here. But remember that the, the conventional is what's real, but not in the way we think of it. So I don't, you know, he's, he's not writing here, he's not writing about ethics. In other places he did. Like his advice to kings and stuff like that. That would that would be about ethics, but here he's not doing that. So I don't I don't see. I don't see that there's a conflict of that, and he, you know, if we have if we are to have this open mind that is always aware that our thinking is bound in some way by conventions, if only the conventions of grammar then of course different monastic codes can all be fine. You know, I, I, I don't understand the import of your question. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm able to articulate any yeah. further. Um, yeah. I, what, I mean, you, you, you use the, you said that, you know, the conventional is equal to the absolute. And remember what I mean by conventional. I don't mean like, you know, dressing the way your mommy would like you to dress. I mean, being bound by the mental conventions. Like, right. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, the material world, the reification is equal mm -hmm. to the no. absolute. No, 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 no. He's he is putting down reification he's putting down nihilism he's putting down both of them he's saying it's much more flexible interpenetrated you can't define things it's it's more this like if you if you try to make something sort of have an absolute um have an absolute uh some kind of absolute nature so 
so in the beginning I said, you know, that, that emptiness implies no self nature, but it's more than no self nature because it's not just no self nature, it's no nature like this pen, the blackness of the cap. That's, we could say the blackness of the cap of this pen, that's the nature of this pen cap. But he would say, no, even that is provisional. And not provisional in the sense of temporary, provisional in the sense of no, no substance, empty. So, yeah, it's, you can't, it's almost impossible to say. That's why Nagarjuna is a whole bunch of negations. He just keeps saying, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. No, that's not right. Then at the end, he says, no view is right, you know? Because you really can't say it in a positive way, because to say it in a positive way <clears throat> is to pin it down, and you can't pin it down, because then you're trapped by mental conventions. But, but isn't he ultimately saying that Buddhism is correct? He is working from the context of Buddhism. I don't think it would ever occur to him to question no. whether Buddhism is correct or not. He's not arguing with non-Buddhists. Mm. Yeah. Buddhism is his world. That's what, you know, it's like Thomas Aquinas, does, um, you know, Stan, who's hiding his videographer. Thomas Aquinas, I don't think he just you know, argues for Catholicism being correct. It's the water in which he's swimming, you know? So it's like that. He, he's not arguing for the correctness of Buddhism. He's assuming the correctness. Right. So back to my original point about givens, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a given. So, yeah. I wonder if I could interject at this point about that yeah. given. Um, yeah. Given what we now know about the science, we know so much more than he did about quantum physics and you mm -hmm. know atomic structure and uncertainty and all that. Uh, when I read Nagarjuna, and I haven't read him for a long time, and it reminded me why I hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> Was he possibly writing this? Um, for the sake of people who have this extreme thinking minds who need to go through this process yeah. until they're exhausted. Yes. And in that sense, you know, I also realized it's like a kongan. He wants you to get so tired, you're just going to say, I'm going to cut all this and just <laughs> let's see if I can figure it out. Doing what the Buddha did, which is sit down and just ask a big question. Um, I'm not sure about the last part, but the first part, Nagarjuna fits, you know, Wittgenstein was a similar philosopher and Wittgenstein did a similar thing where uh, in the philosophical investigations, he um, went through, except he did it largely through imagery. Um, so most of Wittgenstein's philosophical re investigations reads like fire and fuel and that you have a particular situation that he's analyzing. Um, but he's basically going through and saying, well, this is not, you know, um, uh, Garfield has a good word, incoherent. So this point of view is incoherent. That point of view is incoherent. That thing is incoherent. That way of thinking about things is incoherent. And that's what Nagarjuna is doing. That's what Wittgenstein is doing. And in some sense, yes, it's aimed at the people who live in their heads and, um, and think that their opinions are correct. But in fact, what they're saying is incoherent, doesn't make sense. So in some sense, but it's not only those people because we all, you know, most people when they hear about emptiness, you know, they, they you know, everyone thinks like this pen is a thing. It's a thing, it's a pen. It has this existence as a pen, you know? It's really hard to think of it as, no, that's just how we're thinking about it, you know? So he's not just, arguing with the philosophers, he's also presenting something to everyone. But yeah, it's mostly only philosophers who have the patience to go through it. But yeah, you know, I don't know what his meditation practice was. He was before, uh, before Zen. I don't know if at that time they had meditation practices that were the same as Great Question. I really don't know. And if anyone does know, I'd love to find out. Um, I have a, uh, I, ha I have a quote, Judy, above yeah. my computer. 
Yes. Uh, that comes from the Swampland Flowers by Zen Master Tao Wei. Yeah. And it reads this way, very briefly, the ancestral teachers coming from the West only means that winter is cold and summer is hot, night is dark, and day is light. It's just that we vainly set up meaning where there is no meaning, <laughs> concern where there is no concern, impose inside and outside, where there is no inside or outside and talk endlessly of this and that where nothing exists. This sounds like it's a direct uh, takeout from the uh, uh, erudition of Nagarjuna. Okay, so uh, wh what can you tell me about that? Well, you said, uh, you said it a lot. Yeah, the, the, the ending of it, but you know, summer is hot. What is hot? What is summer? You know, you have to, you have to go even for, yeah. you know, and yeah, summer is hot. If, at least if you live in Kansas, summer is hot. But I think what he's driving at to me and what, what I get from that is that we place, we place meaning on these different things where there is really no meaning to it. That is, that is certainly correct. Yes. Yeah. We, we are creating meaning and mistaking meaning for reality. Right. Yes, yeah, we're, we're mistaking meaning for uh, for that. You're absolutely right. And some people have been asking questions on chat, and I'd like to get to those people. First, I want to ask Nick, the complete text, is that Garfield's translation or is it um, some other translation? Correct, Judy. It's the it's the same one that you held up earlier. Fabulous. So everybody copy that link. <laughs> Everybody can read Garfield and they don't have to hunt it down because it might even be out of print. Who knows? That's fabulous. So everybody just copy that link right now and paste it into whatever you want to paste it in. Um, that I is think you can just click the link and download and then come back to your screen. Yeah, you can do that too. Yeah, I always hate leave, leaving a Zoom meeting screen. Okay, thank you, Nick. That is amazing. Okay, so Brad Clee, do you, uh, where's Brad? Um, do you want to do you want to ask your question? Is Brad here? Yes. No video, but he's there. Yeah, but Brad, can you uh, can you unmute, unmute yourself? Yeah, now okay. you can ask question. Can you... We'd like to see you if we may. Okay, I gotta figure out how to turn the video on. On the lower left. Says video. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for it. Or else, or else, else, or else, by three dots, um, three dots by your name. Okay, now unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, okay, so another, I was asking about the sky, mm -hmm. but I guess another way to ask that question would be, um, you know, now that we have science, and mm -hmm. science gives all these very deep explanations for the world around us, and those explanations that are given in science have already been subject to a lot of skepticism. What, so does the Nagarjuna's perspective then mean that even though we've got these really great explanations, we should keep exposing them to skepticism so that we can get better explanations? Well, that's actually the scientific method. That's what scientists do. Mm -hmm. so, so, sure. <laughs> so do you then read Nagarjuna as being maybe a very early proponent of the scientific method? No, because he didn't have the notion of experiments. Um, and could you uh, mute yourself when you're not talking because somehow it's interfering with, thanks. It makes, no, we want to see you. We want to see you, Brad. Yeah. We sit, when, I'm going to, when you're unmuted, it makes me echo for some reason. It just sets up a weird thing. Um, yeah, so first of all, they did have science, some form of science back then, and any kind of human 
grouping had observation and then learning from the observation and acting from what you've learned from the observation and then refining it and making it better. You have to just to stay alive, you know. But yeah, the, the rigorous notion of science that we have, they didn't have. And certainly the, um, although, you know, a lot of those ancient cultures, they had notions that were very similar to um, things like atoms and stuff like that. They, they had some very sophisticated ways of looking at things. Um, but what was interesting is what you wrote was one view is that the sky is molecular assemble ensemble that does or does not explain blue sky mind so saying the sky is blue that is a matter of perception the sky is not blue if you're colorblind and the sky is not blue if you don't have the idea of blue you know we can see many 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 colors if you look at the sky it's well right now the sky is gray but when the when the sky is blue there are many shades of blue we just say the sky is blue. Our house used to be um, a kind of funny color that I thought was blue and my husband thought was green. But it wasn't blue-green. I don't know what it was, but I thought it was blue and he thought it was green. And now it's this funny color that is listed as something like steel green, but I think it's brown. <laughs> you know. So there's a word in psychology for this, and I forget what it is, and if anyone, you know, remembers in uh, actually philosophy of perception is a word of philosophy of perception for this phenomenon of what I'm talking about. But yeah, so um, yeah, science is science is part of this big soup we call the conventional, the, um, the relative. It's is part of the soup. And there's no problem with it. It doesn't refute and it doesn't support and the guardian doesn't support, refute or support it. He is talking about a, another bunch of, of things entirely. You know, this notion of sort of indivisible essence and how does one indivisible essence arise from another indivisible essence. That's what he's really talking about. So thank you. And Liatris also had um, a question and you want to ask it in person and hopefully you can yeah, could, yeah, can you draw some connections um, from this to the Bodhisattva way, which uh, comes a few centuries later, as far as um, a way of being in the world? So I'm surprised that you say the Bodhisattva way comes centuries later, because Nagarjuna was part of the Mahayana, and the Mahayana is the Bodhisattva way. So I don't think it came centuries later. I think it came before. Nagarjuna. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of Shanti Deva, I think. Okay. Well, didn't I didn't he know. come after, didn't he come after? You're better, read, you're better read than I am, but the Bodhisattva way, the notion of a Bodhisattva is very fundamental to Mahayana Buddhism. Okay. And it, that definitely predates Nagarjuna because he's, he is in the Mahayana, and he, the Mahayana had been established long before Nagarjuna. He, so what the context? Wait, wait a second. That's the context in which he's working, and the um, the um, what the the notion of the of the Bodhisattva of you know that the awakening of all beings is what the bodhisattva is dedicated to and that the bodhisattva will not themselves enter nirvana until all beings can enter nirvana this notion of my life is not about me you know it's not mm -hmm. about my awakening it's about all beings awakening together that is exactly supported by codependent origination that we are not separate and the Gardener supports that by emptiness. So what these abstractions are doing is they're supporting exactly compassion. And when you think of it, if you try to argue compassion on other grounds, like, well, when you do good things, you feel good. 
or you know the karma thing do a good thing and later you'll get rich or later you'll go to the tushita heaven or you know whatever it is you know like the emperor Wu, you know asking bodhidharma well i've done all these great things you know what kind of merit have i attained <laughs> you know and bodhidharma says nothing no merit you know right so this mind that has the notion of i of self as distinct from other that kind of mind cannot be compassionate. And Nagarjuna is cutting away at any way of thinking that I am separate from you, that this pen is separate from this phone. He's cutting away at any notion of separateness. So in some sense, this is a profound basis of compassion. Mm. And in some sense, it's, you know, as far as I can tell, it's in some sense the only real support of compassion. You know, that that the minute we start viewing things otherwise, then that's where lack of compassion comes in, you know? But if we see that we are not separate, then how can we not be compassionate? So, yeah, thank you for your question. Judy? Yeah. So, you know, as I listen to you talk, it's like I see the urgency and I see the importance of what Nagarjuna is saying, but I also, I think I'm figuring out why I have trouble with him because you said he uses logic and language to explode logic and language, and I'm all about language as an English teacher, so maybe that's what befuddles me when I try to read it. Is there a good place how do you recommend one reading Nagarjuna or where to start or? Well, I recommend Garfield's book. I ha actually have Garfield's book. But um, because you are an English teacher and you teach poetry and other things like that, I would recommend a book by Leslie Scalapino. And I'm looking at my shelves to see if I can see the, yeah. Hold on a second. I'm going to grab this book for you. Let me make myself invisible. I'll be right back. And Jonathan might also know this book. It's Leslie Scalapino's The Public World Slash Syntactically Impermanence. And from the title, you can tell that she's already exploding language. And Leslie Scalapino is a very, was a very interesting um, poet and um, very interested in exploding language and also a very serious student of Zen, of Soto Zen. And she actually has an article of an essay in this on Nagarjuna and um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll write to you separately, send me a note, and I'll write to you with more information about this book. And um, so, okay. Thank you. Yeah. And um, let's see, uh, somebody had a hand raised. I think it was Nick. Nick, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, that was me, Judy. Um, I have a, okay. I think it might be kind of a complex question about Nagarjuna. Yeah. Um, and my question might just be pure conjecture. But um, not only is Nagarjuna regarded as one of the ancestors of the Zen lineages, he's also the ancestor of the Pure Land lineages. And oh, okay. I didn't know that. I knew he was Tibetan, but I didn't know he was Pure Land also. Okay. Yeah, he, he and Vasubandhu are regarded as the first and second patriarchs of the Pure Land lineages. Cool. And um, Nagarjuna was the very first one that actually made a distinction in what he called the difficult practices and the easy practice of uh, Buddha name recitation. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've just never really been able to reconcile why, you know, first you just read him clearly, he's, he's mastered, you know, the Zen practice, you know, even if we weren't calling it Zen practice then. And um, you know, why would he teach these two different practices? Um, and I mean, like, even he himself was, a, you know, was devoted to Amitabha Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've just never really been able to figure out 
why the distinction and why does he himself who's clearly just so brilliant and he's had all these awakenings and insights would still advocate the easy path of a faith-based practice boy that was had a lot of assumptions there nick <laughs> you know that there's a there is this tendency of of um zen buddhists to put down pure land i mean it's just amazing it's just amazing how we put it it's the easy path why what i've never done it why what why do we think it's easy those, those were his those were his own words he called he said you know just calling the name of amitabha buddha it's like riding a ship on the waves Whereas this other practice, he he called it as traveling by land and climbing over mountains. So where where did you which book is this in? Um, I'll I'm happy I'll send you the letters of Honan, who was you know one of the first major propagators of the right. Carolina method in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, Master Shan Dao in uh, China. I think he was one of the first major um ancestors to advocate parallel practice he he also references nagarjuna in his commentaries right but um, you don't have a reference from nagarjuna uh he wrote the the gathas on um hymns hymns in praise of amitabha buddha okay and and you you've seen that uh, I believe so. I'll, let me okay. let me go through my Google Great. Drive and I will send you everything I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very cool. Yeah, I did not know that. I knew that he was at the base of Tibetan and I knew he was at the base at, at Zen. I didn't. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So what's wrong with being on a boat and what's wrong with climbing a mountain? You know, the, there are 84,000 expedient means. So 84,000 expedient means means don't privilege yours. Nagarjuna's analysis of what's real, of how this universe actually is, is not dependent on the form of practice. It's not dependent on pure land or Zen, which didn't exist at the time. And I don't know if pure land existed at the time, it's not dependent on Tibetan Buddhism, which certainly didn't exist at that time. It's not dependent on any of those things. It's not even, you know, when you you can strip away the Buddhism and it's not even dependent on Buddhism. And uh, there is this book whose title I can't find, and it just came out like a few months ago, and I have to look harder at it, and it's written by um, a, a Western philosopher, I'm pretty sure he's American, um, which basically lays out Nagarjuna's philosophy without reference to Nagarjuna past the introduction and bases it in words of Western philosophers. And, um, you know, Garfield also, he, he'll say things, oh, this is like Hume, oh, this is like Wittgenstein, oh, this is like this, oh, this is like that, you know. So this stuff is not limited, it's human. It's a way for human beings to look at the world. So why not pure land? You know, the guy, he was a practical guy. He advised kings, you know, so why not? And yeah, um, we've people who hold this thing about how Shin Buddhism, pure land Buddhism is somehow lesser. I mean, put that down. It might amuse you to know that they think that, um, Zen is lesser because we throw out too much. Um, you know, there was a, a wonderful woman in town and who died, I'm forgetting her name, and, and she was really quite wonderful. She did a lot for like local um, local social service agencies and, and stuff like that. She did a lot for the community and she was Japanese American and was raised a Shin Buddhist. And um, when she died, her husband came to us and said, um, well, can we borrow some Buddhas for her funeral? You know, do you have Buddha statues? And we, oh, sure. You know, and we gave him his choice and the minister came, but her, her, her obituary said, 
you know, she was a believer in true Buddhism, not like these Zen Buddhists, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who, who don't, you know, who just sit there, <laughs> you know, and don't, don't care about the rest of the world. And the, so the Shin Buddhist minister, who was like a friend of hers when she was growing up in California, he came to do the funeral, and we showed him, you know, our statues for him to pick, and he said, he was really impressed, you have all these statues? You know, you have a Vahurchana, and you have a Sitagarbha, and you have a, you know, Avalokiteshvara, you have all these statues? And we're like, yeah, we have these statues, you know, not to Shakyamuni. And so, yeah, so just put, <laughs> put down that prejudice, you know? If you want to get on the boat, get on the boat. If you want to climb the mountain, climb the mountain. If you want to swim in the ocean, swim in the ocean. Take an airplane, you know? Whatever, you know, crawl on your hands and knees, it doesn't matter. You know, so thank you for your question. Um, I have a note from Lantra Studio privately. The only version I found was Stephen Bausch's version of what? Well, his ver it, his book is called Verses from the Center. So what version of what? Of who? What we've been reading, the Madhya. Ma, Ma oh, oh, it's a version of the Maju Maka Karaka. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was a commentary or something. Okay. Oh, well, cool. there's okay. some of that too, but. Yeah, right. Okay. Fine. It's, yeah. it's not quite as, uh, well, he, he said Garfield was very uh, scholarly. So I guess Bachelor didn't consider his scholarly. It was more poetic than scholarly. Well, you, you all who, now that you can see Garfield, can tell me if Garfield is scholarly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad he has one out because the other English translation, um, besides Garfield, they're so logical. They're just like logicians talking to logicians. They don't get to the soteriology at all. And I have a note here that Bruce keeps raising his hand, and I'm not seeing hands raised, so I guess it's not working. Oh, there, you're raising it personally. Thank you, Bruce. Please ask your question. Yeah, you're in, you're in shadow, so I don't see you clearly. Okay, tell well, us. Good morning, all. Good morning, Judy. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't belong to your sangha. I'm, I live in Arizona. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I, I, I practice Soto Zen. Uh -huh. uh, I um, joined this specifically because uh, I'm retired, and now with COVID, I took it as an opportunity to take a deep dive into uh, some of the ancestors. And Nagarjuna is one of the ones I took a deep dive into mm -hmm. and continue to. Mm -hmm. um, and I find him uh, to be incredibly practical in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea about no view is right. I take that to mean no view. And when I look at my pe the people I sit with, there's not one person in that group that uh, is voting for Trump. Mm -hmm. That view that everyone that I know has that he is, that these people are bad. Most Buddhists I know believe they're evil. Uh, and you know, how do you say we both vow to save everyone? How do you save people you can't stand? Uh, and uh, that has been my practice. Uh, and the more I look at it, I feel compassion for Trump. I don't think he's an evil man. And I think that we blame him for, he's part of the problem, but we make it like we reify him and we reify what, uh, what is done. And he's the one that causes it instead of looking at it as being so many conditions and there is no one doing it. But I can't get anybody in my practice to agree with me about this. That I feel like you know, they all say, no, nah, he's bad. Do you have anyone in your sangha who uh, is uh, voting for Trump who belongs with them? Well, first of all, I would really, you know, if we were in the same room, I'd be shaking your hand because I completely agree with you. Um, and uh, the the polarization, it, the demonization on both sides, you know, each side is demonizing the other side. And yeah, this is, is problematic. And I do feel that Trump is suffering terribly and that his actions are all coming out of his suffering, his own personal suffering. And mostly people's actions comes out of their personal suffering. So he's not unique that way. I don't know if there's anyone in our Sangha 
who is voting for Trump. Uh, you know, Harris is from the Czech Republic, so he's not voting for Trump or Biden. Um, Eileen is from uh, Singapore, so she's not voting for Trump or Biden. Um, I'm looking around the room. Andy's in England, so he's not voting for Trump or Biden. Uh, Tobias is in Germany. He's not voting for Trump or Biden. Um, but your question of your question is really, what do we mean when we say we're open and inclusive? And I find for me, Judy, uh, that uh, when I had and when I allow myself to have this hatred, mm -hmm. it's not about being open and inclusive. It's about solidifying me. That's right. Uh, well, I forgot I'm to say, right. Yeah, and I thought, forgot to say Max is in Honduras, so he's not voting either. Although, I don't know if you're a U.S. citizen, Max, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, so, um, but, yeah, so there's a thing of, of how hatred is like drinking poison and thinking it'll kill the other person. That's, but there's something else here, and this is, is something, um, this is way off the topic of Nagarjuna, but I think it's, it's really something that I feel very deeply. If there are any Trump supporters in our song, oh, Vivian's in Canada. Okay, she's not voting either. Um, but um, but if there were Trump supporters in our sangha, I think they'd have a hard time outing themselves because there is this kind of assumption that we have that we're politically homogenous right now because of the because of the um, the terrible schism, the judgments on all side, that it's very hard for somebody to say that they disagree with the tenor of the organization. I have a close friend who is a Trump supporter, and we haven't talked in a long time. We just make little comments on each other's Facebook pages that are not about politics. Um, it's hard for her to be around people who are not Trump supporters. And she actually left. Um, the, I'm also a member of the Jewish congregation and she was on the board and she left because she felt that they were not respecting her views. And she felt that she just couldn't fit in anymore, you know? And that kind of polarization, that kind of, um, it's not even necessarily demonization because everybody loves this woman. She's a really terrific person, but it's this, kind of polarization and this ability to sort of open our hearts to each other. Yeah, that is very disturbing to me. It's very disturbing. And when we talk about having inclusive sanghas, you know, and we think of it in terms of race and ethnicity and gender and stuff like that, we need to think of it in terms of political opinions. But right now in the American climate, this is very, very difficult to accomplish. And, you know, it's like um, Protestant churches a long time ago. Well, how can it be long if it's in America? But in America, sometime in the last 100 to 150 years, Protestant churches basically split into left wing and, and right wing. And you know, when you go to the um, the Presbyterian Church downtown, they're all in favor of left wing causes. And you go to, you know, some of the, some of the fundamentalist churches, and they're all in favor of right wing causes. And it's very very difficult to bridge that gap. And um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And I just encourage everyone to open their hearts. And yeah, like you say, Nagarjuna tells us, don't hold any views. You know. Which is not saying to be dispassionate and say, oh, this person is suffering, but that's okay. I'm not going to hold any view. No, obviously, you reach out to help however you can reach out to help. But you also, um, you know, you look at the human being, you look at the situation, and you don't hold to the ideology. And I have to say, my friend who's voting for Trump, um, she is one of the most compassionate people that I know. And when we've worked together in the soup kitchen, she really sees each person in that soup kitchen line as an individual. She doesn't see that they're homeless. She doesn't see that they're dirty. She doesn't see, you know, you can tell by the way she interacts with them. She does that much more than I do, you know. So, yeah, we have to, we have to really... Judy, from a practical point of view, yeah. 
Uh -huh. So, okay, so you say, um, you know, we shouldn't have views, shouldn't, right? No, I said I, don't hold views. You have to have views. views, but don't you hold. Have to hold views. So you're not attached as much to them. Yeah. Do you have a practical way? I mean, the only way I have to work with this is when I have the when I have the feelings is just to go into the bodily sensations and just be there with it as much as I can and see what they are. Do you have any ways? Uh, I mean, how do you work with this? To okay, so so um, you're you're practicing Soto Zen. Yeah. So we're a Lin Chi lineage, and one of the we we have a number of techniques, none of which is Shikantaza, but we have a number of techniques that we use. But one of them, and one of the most powerful, is Great Questioner or Wato, or Wadu, and that means that whatever appears, just what is this? Just like that, what is this? Without analyzing, just what is this? You just dive deep exactly what we do your practice our practices are the same there are some uh, there are some forms that are different but all practices are the same i, I heard okamura i don't know if you know about okamura give a talk on yeah, uh, yeah. he gave a talk on pure lens and he showed that pure lens and is no different from soto Zen. we're all exactly the same just a little bit different uh, forms <laughs> i don't know if you saw nick gave two thumbs oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <To> you nick <laughs> Right. That's interesting because I've never heard Shikantaza described as great questions. So thank you. That's when you get this feet when I get the feeling, it's just what is this? And chicken it's not actually Shikantaza. It's work off of the Shikantaza yeah. is not that. It's becoming five skandhas and just being there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I uh, like to comment on what Bruce just uh, asked. Um, I work in Johnson County, Kansas, which is highly um, Republican. And so I'm in the department of more than 30 people. And then uh, we work together. Uh, I don't really have any idea what's the percentage of people are voting for the Republican or what percentage of people are voting for um, the Democratic Party. Um, I find uh, that it's possible to work together in day-to-day -day life and uh, for just to observe, you know, what every one of us do, we're not all that different from the day-to-day -day life. How do we handle our students? How do we handle, you know, we work together very closely. Uh, so yesterday we had this all departmental meeting and it just happened actually, this is very close to uh, you know, election time. I have many friends who are Republicans, yeah. And they, um, you know, I have a very close friend who, who was a Trump voter and he, she almost dumped me, very, very close friend. She took care of me when I was sick, took care of uh, my father when I was sick and he was sick, you know, was a great help, but she's still taking care of my advisor and their children when my advisor is going through surgery. Uh, you know, I don't really know if she is still voting for Trump, but uh, we, uh, it was a little tough uh, in the beginning, and I made a point to have an apartment right beside her in Kansas City, Missouri, just so I could keep this friendship because I grew up in communist China. It doesn't make any sense to lose a friend like that over politics. And uh, I think what Nagarjuna wanted to say is everything's just a dream. Yeah? So uh, we're just aware of my dream uh, should be no different from other people's dream, you know. And uh, so something happened yesterday during the departmental meeting one of the person who is not voting for Trump hold up uh, a, a glass, you know, something you drink water out of it. So it looked like, um, what do you call this? It was um, the bleach, yeah? What Trump was making fun of you. If you, do, you could drink the bleach and then you will be cured for the COVID. So this person uh, just hold up this thing and show it up in the monitor. I have, I sh my monitor have 25, you know, and then I have to go to the second screen to watch how everybody was reacting to this thing. When majority of people start to laugh, and I did find myself uh, a little bit, it's funny, okay? My first reaction was wanted to laugh. But then I also saw one of my best friends in the department who couldn't laugh at all, yeah? And then there are uh, uh, 
a few others. We are very good friends. We work together. We're very close. We've been together for 15 years. It's almost like a family. And it's very hard to watch them try not to be angry and try not to come out as uh, they are going to continuously vote for their party. And I'm not even knowing if they're voting for Trump, but it's their party. And then throughout the last four years, I felt they were really, really hurt by this whole thing because Trump hijacked their party. Okay, so they are, it's not like these people are voting for Trump. We don't know why they voted for anyone. But so this is, I said, you know, I happen to be in an environment that I have very many friends, um, you know, and I'm personally feel indebted to during the Republican administration, I was the one who benefited from opened up China by Nixon's administration, then Bush senior and all that. So I, I'm a Chinese, we learn to be grateful. <laughs> so, and I was not political, I couldn't vote. And I was very disillusioned by the communist uh, government. So I never really trust anybody, let alone a government. But uh, so I start to vote when Bush senior start to invade Iraq, that's something I couldn't stand. So I start to vote, but I didn't become any party until what? I didn't join it until Trump got involved because the very first thing he did is the thing to chase the immigrants and scientists out and I couldn't stand it, so I joined the party. So, but that doesn't mean I don't have any way of seeing other people are suffering. And I see many of my friends who are Republicans are really, they really are suffering because that's not what they think their party ought to be. And since they trust me, so we talk about things like that. So I think that's about all we can do. I'm still not very political, but I will vote for whoever I think it's going to resolve the current situation, which I don't see it's a very pleasant situation. So that's my input on something like that. Thank you. And Brad, you have your hand raised. Th this is also kind of a follow up question. The poem, Call Me By My True Names, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you think that that's an example or a good example of not holding a view. You know, I don't know yeah. that poem. It's Thich Nhat Hanh, right? Yes. Um, so do you have it handy? Can you read it to us? Oh, sorry, I don't. Okay. Let me very quickly see if I can call it up. Okay, Google. Thich Nhat Hanh, call me by my true name. Nope, can't get it. It says, got it, give me more information and I'll find it for you. <laughs> Uh, if someone else can uh, find it and, and um, very quickly and read it, uh, that would be great. And meanwhile, I'll ask if there's, it's it's getting really late here. So are, are there any other questions? Oh, well, Jane, yeah. I ask you about like the sky, the blue sky, when you said Nagarjuna was saying that the, it's not, it's, it is not a blue sky, but it's not not blue, or the sky is blue, it's not blue, but it's not not blue. And I was well, talking about that experience. It's... And I think what I was wondering is, yeah, there's a point at which there you can't talk, you can't use language, you can't describe, you can't um, point. Mm -hmm. There is nothing you can do except you see it or you experience it in however you experience, mm -hmm. but there is no more you can do. You can't talk about it. You can't tell somebody about it. Kind of like the fish, I guess. It's So is that what he's talking about? Is it just, it's just tearing it down to where it's just that, or is it even less than that? I think he's, I don't know if tearing it down is, is the way to put it, but it's more like exposing the, the conventional nature of everything, even the notion of sky, like where does the sky begin? Where does the sky end? You know, 
um, the notion of blue, um, the experience of, you know, experiencing a blue sky. And um, then, um, you know, all of that, just, just really analyzing, analyzing, analyzing. And all these people have been giving me links. So let me go to the Brad's link to the poem. Hello, are you going to come up for me? It's not coming up. I'm clicking. There we go. Okay. Oh, that's or okay. Here we go. All right, I'm going to read it. The poem. Uh, Please call me by my true names by Thich Nhat Han. Don't say that I will depart tomorrow. Even today, I'm still arriving. Look deeply. Every second, I am arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of the flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond, and I am the grass snake that silently repeats itself on the frog. I'm the child in Ungando, all stick, skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks, and I'm the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. And so on, it, it, oh no, it's, it's, it ends pretty quickly after that. I'm the 12-year-old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate, and I'm the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I'm the member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands, and I'm the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people, dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true name so I can hear all my cries and all my laughter at once, so that I can see all my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open the door of compassion. Um, this, in some sense, this is an expression of interbeing, but in some sense, it's a lot of reification. So, um, which is not putting it down, it's just saying I don't see this as expressing um, Nagarjuna. And then there's a private comment that someone made that if you were black or queer, the matter of reification is more than a philosophical construct. Thank you for that comment. The person who made it, that is absolutely true. Um, yeah, these things become politicized. Um, so yeah. Yeah, reification is such a trap. Just such a trap. And we have to do it because that's how we, that's how our minds function in the world. But yeah, keep humility about it. Um, don't, don't swallow it. Don't fall for it. Don't believe it. Understand that it's a tool. You know. So. And um, I do want to say I think I've made Nagarjuna seem a little bit more nihilist than he is, you know, that the, the conventional is the absolute, the absolute is the conventional, this world of, you know, pens and phones and faces on a screen, it's absolutely real, but it also is not what we think it is. And I guess that's a, unless someone else has a question, that's a, and that's a really good place to end. So thank you very much. You guys are amazing, fantastic. It was wonderful to meet some new people and from all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Judy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.